Well, good morning everyone and welcome to the Sunrise Drive here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands, South Africa. As you can see, we've got off to an incredibly lucky start and that's why we started the feed a little bit earlier to show you these playful lions. They seem to have all just gone back to sleep now, so I'm glad we did start up a few minutes ago so you could see some images of them playing about. And this is the Inkahuma Pride of Lion. It's a Pride of Lion that we saw last night. And they haven't moved very far from where they were. To be honest, we are very, very close to Gowrie Dam, where there's a live waterhole camera. And it was that same waterhole camera that helped us to find these animals yesterday afternoon. Prior to us finding them yesterday afternoon, they had spent the last two and a half days feeding on a hippo. And that's probably why they haven't moved too far this evening. There is also some interesting dynamics in terms of lion in this area and that is we had a report that there was two members of a coalition from the Styx Pride or the Styx Coalition. There are two males that we haven't seen yet but we know they cross through the northwestern corner of our property sometime two nights ago and then last night they must have come back in and we actually heard them calling last night and Brent did go up to follow up on them this morning but sadly their tracks have crossed in and out of our property but the presence of those two males and you could call them new males they haven't spent much time here in the past may have caused this pride to stay put and stay away from the north and western parts of our property where they do occasionally spend time. It will be interesting to see what happens going forward though because Brent and myself seem to think that some of the lioness within this pride will be coming into season soon. Even the young male who is a son of these lionesses beginning to show sexually inquiring with pride members that will be the end of his stay and he'll be chased off but for the time being it's a very peaceful and pleasant morning here I can see a fish eagle flying past to the left and interestingly enough we saw one flying on a very similar path yesterday when we were changing our flat tire it does have a kill but I'm not sure what it is Looks like some lion might be heading down to the water hole to drink. So I think we might go and stay with those animals because the, the members here are quite relaxed. <coughs> and just to let you know exactly what the temperature is, it's 18 degrees Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Foul alarm calling, and those will be for the line that are approaching the water hole for a drink. Well, what a great start it is to the morning, and I hope you are all enjoying this. Brent is following up on some. Um, leopard tracks apparently so that's also good prospects and good news for today 
Brent is taking a few days leave, which is much deserved. And oh, here the guinea file. And Mark will be coming back, so that's really good news. Here the guinea file that are alarm calling. And Alex, our tech wizard is also leaving. He's heading back to Moscow for a couple of weeks after a long stint in the bush and some really hard work. This member's calling the rest of the pride. Prospects for us because that lioness has just called the rest of the pride, and maybe they're, they're going to cover some distance now and start moving. And while they do move, they could bump into anything along the way. And even though they're not hugely hungry, predators on the move are always exciting to watch, and the chance of them making a kill is certainly increased. Well, for those of you who may be new to the show, this is a live experience that is happening this very second, probably just many, many miles away from where you are watching. And it's also interactive. You can ask questions, and to do that, you would hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Now we did watch this pride at the same waterhole. This is the dam wall that these two members are on. The waterhole is just down to their left. There was some interesting behavioral interaction with these lion and a few big old buffalo bulls who were relaxing here yesterday afternoon when the lion arrived. The lion had a few just got a great update through from Susan and thanks so much for sending through this update Susan. Susan has informed us that there was lions calling at Arethusa Dam as well and thanks very much for that update Susan. I wonder which pride it could have been possibly the Salala Breakaway Pride, possibly members of the Matimba Coalition who are being chased by members of the Styx Coalition apparently. This is just reports we've had and nothing that we've actually seen. The tracks that Brent did find of the Styx Coalition were heading in the general direction of Arethusa Dam but it's not necessarily them. Interestingly enough the lioness that did try and call the rest of the pride and another one are all heading back there and now this one looks like it's going to be joining She is going to come pacing right past the vehicle. This is going to be awesome.
Okay. Well, a little bit of backwards and forwards with these lines, but that is perfect because, as I said earlier, to have these animals on the move and playing around is really lucky. They can spend many, many hours every day sleeping, up from 16 to 20 hours, depending. So naturally prefer them when they're wide awake and playful than when they're fast asleep. And it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the pride are coming along. The young male looked really grumpy and miserable and you could almost see a look in his face wondering why the rest of the pride had got up so early. I'm just going to turn my game drive channel back on. I have had it off. We've got new radios and it's difficult to control all the sound coming through from the guides as we don't have earpieces for them yet. <laughs> Updates on the Kuma part. It's just myself here. Uh, still lying up off Twin Dams, just south of Gary Dam. But the sun's poking up, we're going to have some wonderful golden light for VM to film these animals and share with you all the beautiful sighting that we are having here. Andrew, But it will be very interesting to see what happens with this pride during the course of this morning because I keep looking back to the north and west and this could well be where they heard the Sticks Coalition vocalizing last night. Who knows, maybe it's something else that they can hear. But they have been looking up in that direction. And as I was saying, it'll be interesting to see where they move to. They haven't moved the whole night, which is fairly uncommon for lion. Even though they are full-bellied, they finished their hippo kill not last night, but the night before last, and that was at Buffalo's Hook Dam. Everyone went searching for them yesterday morning, but couldn't actually find them. So they had moved moved away from the dam even though the I just need to listen quickly I thought I heard monkeys alarm calling could be dreaming Anyway, it is uncommon for a lion to not move any distance over the period of a whole night. And I've got a feeling they may decide to move for us in the sunlight, which will be great, because we often miss where they move, because they are predominantly active at night. Which will be a great opportunity for us to follow them around and see what they get up to. It looks like Texans are arriving to join us in the sighting, which is great news. Both Tex and Aubrey are around at the moment. And happy to have them back to help us out.
Good morning, Blair, on Twitter. Blair has highlighted a very good point here. I've been saying that we've got some information regarding the Sticks Mail Coalition, as well as the Timber Mail Coalition, and she is wondering where that information's come from because she hasn't heard anything posted by surrounding camps where this interaction may have occurred. It's a very good question, Blair, and Brent is the one who passed on this information to me. There is a group that everybody communicates on, the guides within the Sabi Sands, sharing information on the different prides. Where exactly this happened and where the information comes from, I don't actually know. And it is a good point and something that we should all consider when out here is all the information that you do here, you do have to query. And thanks for querying this, Blair. I sadly don't know the answer. Brent may be able to help us with that because he passed on this information to me. And as much as we like to try and know every finer detail about what goes on with these animals, the reality is that there's no way to do Kathy in Indiana, good, uh, good, good morning, and look at this one scratching and sharpening its claws. This is how they maintain their claws. It's their health spy equivalent, I guess, and that is a very large bush willow. It looks like a red bush willow that it's using to sharpen its claws on. Kathy would like to know if these lions kept us awake last night. And interestingly enough, we actually came and looked for them shortly after drive last night to show the crew who don't get out with us every day, Nikki and Tara and Alex, who are stuck in the final control. And we came to look for them and couldn't actually find them initially. Went home, had dinner, and at around 9.30 we heard some more roaring and rushed out to come and try and find them and we did find them lying up very close to where they are now. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle quickly. This lioness is giving the male a bit of a te attitude and that's understandable because again she could be the one coming into season and that's why he responded and got up and went up to her so quickly. Just going to move the vehicle. So they didn't keep us awake, but they did get us out of the house last night. <coughs> and this morning at about 5:30, we heard them roaring again, which was. You can see him scent marking this He is in a situation where he actually needs to be forced out of this pride and he will be forced out. The tough thing for this individual is that he is on his own. The lion stand a far greater chance if they're born with brothers that they can team up with when they do get kicked out of home, but he in all likelihood will be completely alone and have a very rough, rough and rocky road ahead of him.
as he loses this pride and also loses the protection of his fathers who have protected him and kept other males at bay. It is interesting times though and no different to the life of any other young male lions. It's all part of what they go through. I'm interested, interested to see what the other lioness are doing. There, there are a few that have headed off further south of where we are, in the same direction where you can see the individual heading to now. And hopefully they'll rally the rest of the pride and get moving. Rosie on Twitter would like to know whether these, some of these lines did in fact mate with the Matimba males and yes Rosie they could well have and have certainly done so in the past. I'm not sure when you are referring to though Rosie so sad it's difficult for me to answer your question and I cannot remember or think of any matings that were seen recently by us, um, please do, do send any more information on this and as to when you th think they were seen mating with the Matimbas. And for those of you who are new to the show, just to clear up, the Matimba Male Lion Coalition did initially start with four individuals. They split up into two groups of two, of which two we see here. And those two, well, one of those two, are the fathers of this young male. Playful, but critical practice for the youngsters to hone their stalking and hunting and pouncing. And who better to practice with than your family? Now, squirrels alarm calling are one of the main signals or signs that help us to find animals and you can hear one calling now so that's a squirrel's alarm call an unhappy squirrel that's woken up to a pride of lion on its doorstep okay well this is looking good folks and I want to loop ahead of these lines I think they are getting on the move now of deciding where to stop after having tried to forecast their movements. Uh, what is going on here? Looks like a family pylon. Mark 
Martin from Johannesburg, good morning and welcome on board. Martin would like to know why they have these black markings behind their ears and as we get into position you'll notice that behind the ears you'll have these black tufts as well as their dark black tails and often in nature animals have got distinctly different colored ears as well as tails which are good follow me signals or signs for youngsters to follow so that is the reason for it and no different to leopard having a white tail tip even though they've just been apart for a few minutes they often have very elaborate greetings lioness who's becoming less and less tolerant of him. Morning everyone. How are you doing? Well, as you can see it looks like they've found a cable of some sort and cats will be curious it's certainly not ideal but there's sadly no way of intervening and stopping them doing what they're doing and it's nothing to worry about considering all the other things they chew on and come across out here it's not that you have to be concerned but like I say, just not ideal. Well, is this going to be the shady spot where they rest for the entire day? I hope not. Well, what I can tell you is that they will always have to swim around slightly as the sun moves from east to west so you may find them on the other side of this bush this afternoon Now, one thing I will forecast for a little bit later on this morning is the arrival of buffalo to this dam, as well as other antelope and other animals. And the area that they're lying in here is perfect. Because it's fairly well wooded, there's lots of hiding places for them to literally sleep, but in an ambush position, so that if anything does stumble upon them, they're going to have lots of cover with which to use and stalk their prey. If it is buffalo that will be arriving, and I can almost it was a very half-hearted attempt. But now that they're a little bit more hungry. their demeanor may change and we may find them a little bit more willing to take on a risk and take on these buffalo.
Well, I've just got an update from Angie in Ohio, and she said the Matimba males were mating with some of these Kohuma females in late February, and I don't remember that, so maybe I wasn't here. But what would also be interesting to know is how many of the females were actually mating. It may not have been all of them. Anyway, thanks very much for that update, Angie. And if they did in fact mate successfully at the end of February, it should mean that by the end of May, or beginning of June, there should be some cubs on the way, because it's about a three month gestation period for the lion. Bularay on Twitter, good morning and welcome. Bularay would like to know the degree of aggression male lions will show to their sons when it is time to chase them up, chase them off. And I think a lot will depend on the son's ability to read into the signals that it needs to leave. If it comes to a point where he doesn't actually want to leave and doesn't get the father's or doesn't read into their fa his father's signals, it would get to a point that they may kill him. Naturally, the young, young males will realize that this is not a good idea and head off before that happens. So I think the aggression will escalate slowly until they eventually do have potentially a scuffle. But it wouldn't make sense that male lions killed their sons when it, they came to maturity. So I think that happens very rarely. Lisa on Twitter would like to know if the females get involved in kicking them out. And actually, no, they won't. They will become intolerance of this pride. So they would accept him if we did create an unnatural scenario where he was the only male available to them they would certainly mate with them. Thankfully though, most of the time Mother Nature takes care of that and young males will move far away from their prides before they are mating. But it is important to realize that in unnatural scenarios this could become a problem because sons will continue to mate with their mothers and that will not be sustainable for the gene pool. Listen carefully, you may ha hear a hyena vocalize. I just heard one whoop, whoop. And will they call again? They often do. And it's such a beautiful call, the whooping call of a hyena. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle ever so slightly because I haven't left them with an angle to do much with here. That's a bit better.
Bob on Twitter. Good morning. Bob's raised a very good point here, and she would like to know what would this young male be called? Would he become part of the Matimba Coalition, or would he become a Nkuhuma young male? This male is that he may possibly take the name of his pride, the Nkuhuma pride, with him, but it all depends on where he ends up. So the property where he ends up and goes to when he does get kicked out of here will determine a name for him. And there are varying things that are looked at when people do name lions or prides of lions or coalitions and it varies from place to place most coalitions are simply named that I've experienced in the Sabi Sands and there's a lot of big coalitions in the Sabi Sands are often named after kind of law enforcement companies or, 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 or names that don't really have anything to do with their pride or where they originated from, but more of their presence and their demeanor. One thing that could happen with this male is that he could possibly join up with a young, another young male and that would be his best option if he comes across other young males that are also flying below the ter flying below the radar of dominant males they could team up help with hunting and help with establishing a coalition and therefore a territory now this is a great opportunity to see the claw Let's see if the one doesn't get its claws out again. There, here we go. We might see it. And again, apologies for the electrical cabling. They must have ripped it off of somewhere around the waterhole cam. I'm not too sure. Anyway. Good morning everyone, uh, my name's Brent, on camera with me is Brian and the Thumb, and uh, welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Sabi Sands. You guys, you guys have been having a fantastic morning with Scott, uh, I hear the Lions have been playing nicely, uh, so what Brian and I did, we went all the way down to the north, uh, western corner of the property, so we could hear the Nkuhuma pride roaring last night, and they were being answered by, it sounded like two males, that we thought might possibly be the Styx males, uh, so we went up there, we did find their tracks, uh, but unfortunately they crossed right through that little top corner of our traverse area, and moved uh, into an area we couldn't go, then we, we found two anti-perching guys cycling down the road on their bicycles, and they said they'd just seen a leopard about an hour before, um, so we went and had a look there, unfortunately we couldn't find anything there so now i'm heading down towards twin dams and i'm gonna go check the, the eastern sections of the property uh, also just i've just had a chat to one of the other guys from the east of us and to let you know for those of you who don't know uh, apparently karula and tingana are on a kill uh, in a place called shirley's and quarantine has been seen here He's also got a kill in this property just behind me here. So hopefully that means they are going to start moving back towards us shortly. So what I'm going to do is go check down in the east and in the north, and maybe we get lucky and find some tracks. Let's get going. For those of you who might be new, um, we are live. So you're seeing exactly what we're seeing at the same time as us. And we're 
also interactive, so you can ask us questions about the African bush as we move through it. We're very, very privileged to be able to share our, our passion for African wildlife with all of you all over the world. See something crossing the road. Let's see if we can catch up with the culprit. I just saw suit across the road. Hopefully we can. Where do you go? Oh, there we go. Good eyes, Brian. Water. So having a nice early morning graze. It is quite a bit warmer than it this morning than it has been. You see how late she is to all the little signs. She was all ready to, to run there. Um, so that's why the water that's why the warthog is out this early. Normally on those really cold mornings, and the warthog's not going to be out um, probably for another half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, so it is quite warm, and I think about 18 degrees Celsius when we started this morning. Oh, and of course, I know. There we go. I thought she was going to stop directly behind the tree, but she is popping out. I'm just using this moment to listen uh, to the bush, see if we can hear anything. Right. Okay. This warthog, she's heading into thickets and I know she was going to run away if we come. And there's also another car coming, so I want to get sneaky ahead. Make sure that... to walk uh, without getting wet and getting grass seeds in their face so they use these these main roads quite frequently uh, as well as obviously the, the big game paths made by elephants and other large animals Well, they might possibly spend less and less time in their natal 
territory. Um, and especially with the leopard, leopard dynamics changing at the moment, uh, with that Anderson male pushing in on Tingana and Tingana pushing in on Mvula, and then that new unidentified leopard that was seen in uh, in the north to the north of us. So there might all that sort of activity. There's been a lot of territorial calling. All that type of stuff might have uh, sort of speeded up the process of these these young males dispersing, which will be very sad because, I mean, we've been very spoiled with the amount we've been able to see them. But as I said, quarantine is not too far from our southern boundary. Um, so it's going to be interesting, an interesting couple of months to see what happens. Ooh, no tracks. You might hear me chatting, um, I'm approaching one of the other vehicles, so I'm just going to have a, a quick morning meeting. and no leopards at the moment, so... I'll try to find them in Google, so... Okay. Okay, well, good luck. <laughs> Have a good morning, everyone. See you around, Ben. Cheers. <laughs> southeastern corner of the property so my planning this, this morning is I've literally driven almost every road inside of Juma and haven't had any luck uh, with any tracks so I'm now checking the peripheries fingers crossed that something moves in um, and gives us a chance to track it but that is what happens in the bush you can't guarantee leopards every day wish we could but uh, it is difficult and we have been very spoilt over the last while so i think it's time to play a little game uh, so you guys let me know what type of quiz you would like the sunrise safari um, you can plant, animal, uh, insect. Um, insect, animal, or plant. Let me know, and you can do that by sending an e email to questions at wildearth.tv you can just use the hashtag safari live if you're on twitter for a second there. Uh, morning, Penny. Uh, Penny is asking, how many years can a warthog live for? Well, Penny, that is really dependent on the warthog. Um, most animals out here very seldom live uh, to die of old age. Normally, as they start 
getting older and losing condition, uh, they are picked off by a predator. But um, if I remember correctly, might be I might be wrong, but I think the water glyphs probably. about between 10 and 15 years but i'm a little bit, i might be wrong but I, I think i'm right about 10 or 15 years could you guys double check that for me please um, and you can send your answers to questions at wild earth Need to listen to the radio quickly. Rita and Raisa, uh, you've both answered on which you would like. Uh, Raisa would like birds, and Rita would like plants and trees, but please, no spiders. Ah, there we go. We're going to start with Rita's request, and this is a follow up, so you guys should be getting to know this one by now. Hopefully, it, it was a new one a few days ago but here we go it's to our left chat it's got those yellow flowers very late blooming this year um, and who can tell me which tree this is and you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or you can just use the hashtag safari live on twitter so Let's see if we can find any tracks. Although at the moment, I might even take an Impala. So maybe we'll get lucky and bump into a nice breeding herd or a must bull. I think might go down and check towards Buffalo Dam. Like it's been really good for elephants in the last the last week, two weeks. Um, so at least we have a plan and we're going to stick to it. would like to know at this time of the year do snakes grow into hibernation uh, or would they be out in the open to warm up well Tom that's a, a good question uh, obviously during our winter months the snakes are not as active as they, they are uh, during the summer months and it also depends on the species uh, some of them will still be active and they will definitely bask in the sun uh, but probably not on a road uh, like here they can feel as minute vibrations that the vehicles cause and a lot of the time the snakes will try or get out of the way and be gone uh, well before um, the vehicle gets close enough to see them and so a good place for a snake to bask is around a big termite mound quite often and that is a home for a lot of snakes um, but then on the other hand certain other species are already in hibernation quite a lot of your your snakes that live underground uh, and your burrowing snakes but because we do 
we don't get truly, truly cold uh, like you guys do in the north. Northern Hemisphere. Um, there are always some snakes that will be active throughout, out throughout the year. Get through to Buffalo's Hook. Ah, there is something interesting. distinct different color and leaf patch in that tree mm -hmm. Michelle from Massachusetts and Catherine from Texas. That is correct. That tree we just stopped at now was a long-tailed cassia. And Donna, well done, guys. So what I just spotted there, um, I think I'm going to have to drive a bit closer to show it to you properly. It's quite interesting. We do get a few different species of this particular thing. Too close. Focus in on that sort on the V where the the sort of roots are coming out. So this is quite an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure if you guys might know, but you can have a look. What Brian's looking at there, you can see the leaves um, of this plant that is growing right up in the fork of a marula. And if we pan out, you can have a look at the marula leaves. We can see the different coloration. Uh, sort of the leaves of that plant are almost a sort of dull olive green. Uh, the marula leaves are, are much, much lighter. Um, and it is a, a plant that's associated with Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think it is worth putting this one out there. Uh, sorry, Raisa, I will get to a bird question now. Actually, you know what? I'm going to tie this in. This is a bird question tied in to uh, this plant that's growing in the marula. Firstly, I'd like to know what is the plant? It's a parasitic plant that is growing in this marula. And uh, the clue is that it's very much associated with Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere. And in this particular area, the seeds of this plant are spread by one particular bird, uh, and I'd like to know what bird is that. So there we go, a bird and plant question tied into one. So what is this parasitic plant that's growing in this marula tree, and what is the bird that spreads its seed? So I'm going to let you guys have a look at it for a few more seconds. Yeah, so that what we're looking at now is this parasitic plant. You can see a few marulas. Um, I'm going to try to go a little bit forward, but I'm just going to try to show you the, the, the root structure of this parasitic plant, where it's growing into the marula tree. Right, just let me know if I get too past, far past the angle. You can see that the marula seems to have grown a much thicker in that particular spot um, where that, that fork is. And that's because um, this parasitic plant causes the tree to release a growth hormone, very similar to gall wasps and gall ants. It's the same hormone. And basically, that means that tree goes, pumps a lot more nutrients into that area and grows quite a lot bigger. And that is where... Uh, that parasitic plant manages to draw 
even more nutrients from the host tree. It's unlikely that these plants would ever kill the host tree, but obviously they are. there's no benefit to these, these plants being in the host tree. Anyway, that's a nice one, tying in plants and birds. So in the meantime, we're going to hit the road and, and head towards Buffalo's Hook. Damn. Cindy and Shanae uh, for coming back to be on that warthog. So there's two different answers. Um, the average lifespan of warthog in the wild, one, one source says 15 years, the other says 18. So even though I might have been a bit rusty on my warthog, at least I was there, thereabouts, it said 10 to 15 years. Um, and I think that obviously also depends on uh, the area those warthogs are in. Uh, can greatly depend. That's why we can always give a sort of average idea of how long an animal is going to live, but you can never, never be 100% certain. And obviously all animals in captivity will always live a lot longer. They don't have any of the, the pressure that a, a wild animal has. Raisa, I'm looking for a bird party. Um, it'd be quite nice to find one. And especially in the early morning, a lot of the bird parties in this area, you can have multiple species, uh, seven, eight species in those bird parties. So hopefully we will find one. I am listening very carefully. I would like to know, do warthogs have nurseries where the young will stay uh, while the adults are foraging? Uh, no, Leanne, um, warthogs are precocial species. There's a word we taught everyone the other day. So uh, precocial species means the babies are born as miniature versions of the adult and are able to run within minutes of birth. So baby warthogs will go out foraging with the adults. Um, Obviously, they are quite vulnerable, and there is quite a high mortality rate on baby warthogs. But warthogs do use uh, burrows that have been made by uh, art farts originally uh, to rest in at night, and that's their sort of safety zone. So as the sun starts setting, warthog will go into their burrow, and that's where they'll spend the night. And in the early morning, uh, when it warms, Warms up a little bit at the moment, the warthogs will come out to spend the day foraging. It is quite a, a successful thing using those burrows, but depending on the soil types, uh, I've seen lions dig warthog out of the burrow, and I've even seen a leopard dig warthog out of a burrow. Uh, and then I've also seen leopard use those burrows to sit above them if they know, if they can hear activity there. Leopard quite often will sit above the burrow and then wait for the warthog to come out. So that's why warthog always comes out head first with those tusks, just in case uh, there might be something waiting outside. And they normally come out with quite a burst of speed. They'll sort of pop their head out, have a look, and then shoot off.
Well done, Jody. Dance anyway, Jody and Anne. We got that parasitic plant correct. It was mistletoe. Now I'm still waiting to see if anyone knew which bird is the one that spreads the seed of mistletoe. One person's close. Uh, Sam said a green tinkerbird. It is not a green tinkerbird. So I'm going to let you guys stew on that one for a, a, a little bit longer. But Sam is the most close with a green tinkerbird. So I'll see if anyone can come up with the correct one. Quite a lot of different bird answers coming in, but D, oopsie, sorry, Sam was the most correct, was in the right general family. Hoping there's going to be something there, uh, maybe some Ellie's. I'm waiting for that answer on the bird that propagates the seed of mistletoe in this area. And it is almost entirely spread by one species of bird. And the general family is a tinkerbird. Tinkerbirds are part of the Barbet family as well. Give you another little clue. So we've just had crested Barbet. No, unfortunately not. We're getting closer though. We're now in the right general vicinity. Tinkerbirds and Barbets. mistletoe in this area. Another interesting thing about mistletoe is uh, it can be harvested to make bird lime. Um, well that and fig trees uh, and bird lime is basically what traditional hunters would have used to catch birds so it becomes very very sticky uh, and then they would put sort of grain or leftover mealy meal pup around there uh, and when the birds came to try feed on this their feet would get stuck in the in the bird lime and would make a nice dinner for that traditional hunter and what do we have at Buffalo's Oak Dam the surfing heron and a hippo So 
there we go. Surfing, surfing heron and a hippo. All quiet on the Bovels Hook front this morning. So I heard, uh, Scotty had some really awesome visuals of a grey heron fishing. So I wonder if it was the same guy. There are quite a few on the property. Very difficult to tell. So guys, it's time. I think it's time unless uh, I've got any more last minute answers on which bird is the one that in this area moves the seeds of mistletoe between trees. I'm just going to give you guys one last minute and then I'll show you which one it is. Suzanne, well done. Yellow fronted Tinkerbird is the one who is 80% of all the mistletoe moved around um, is done by the very pretty little bird. Um, it's got a quite a pretty little voice as well. It's sort of a continuous pop, 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 And here we go. That's the yellow fronted Tinkerbird. Very small, only 10 centimeters in size. So what happens is the seeds of the mistletoe get, are very sticky and they get stuck on the feet of the Tinkerbird. Uh, and as the tinkerbird flies around and moves from tree to tree, those seeds eventually disperse like that. So, well done, Suzanne. Here we go. So I'm just having a quick look around. Um, while we continue to scour, Juma for any sign of leopard tracks. Uh, we're going to cross back to Scotty, who I'm sure has been having a fantastic time with those lines, uh, and see what Scotty has got up to while we've been fiddling around with mistletoe and Tinkerbirds. Sarah from Torchland, have there been any sightings this morning? Welcome back, everyone. And the line have just started moving for, through a very thick block south away from Gowry Dam. So we're not leaving them. We're just going to try and loop ahead in an area that's not too thick. And I'm thinking this is where we'll go in and start having a look-see. And I'm fairly confident we'll find them again. So don't go anywhere. It's eight line that we're busy following. And rather than following them through very, very, very thick bush, I thought I'd rather try and loop ahead that way, not chase away any potential prey, and also have a, a smaller impact on the environment and the trees as possible. Now, the behavior's been very interesting. They haven't been moving very much this morning. They've probably moved a quarter of a mile since you left us about 45 minutes ago. And I'm glad to hear you've been having a fun time with Brent, identifying different trees and vines. You haven't missed anything here. The lions have been fast asleep in some quite thick bush until literally right now where they got up and started moving again. Oh, there they are. I'm just going to stop here. It's not ideal. There's still a lot of thick vegetation, but we've I had some great views of them already and I don't want to be crashing around too much unnecessarily. They are moving generally towards us. And as they get a little bit closer, what I'll try and do is position the vehicle in front of them so they walk past us. But it's important to just stop now and assess 
exactly which direction they're heading and they do veer off course ever so slightly from time to time. And they could well change direction and come straight towards us if we're lucky. time to establish where they are going. We'll just go and stand by over here. They're stopping and starting a lot, but little they have moved this morning. There has been a lot of stop start. It's not uncommon for Lion to move like this quite lazily, you could say, through the bush. It's important for them to move slowly. They'll be cautious of the two sticks coalition members that are now moving through the area. They would have heard them in this thick bush. So lions and leopards will move through the bush, stopping and listening every couple of minutes. And this thick bush that they're moving through is perfect, perfect terrain for them hunting and ambushing anything that could be moving through here. It's getting considerably warmer now that the sun's come out and you will notice I'm busy taking off my jacket. The winter days are typically crisp and cool in the morning, but then they get hot and clear and dry during the day, and you often find yourself stripping off layer upon layer as it does warm up. Oh, I'm probably going to... What's our best option to follow them here? Yeah. Let's see where this little pathway takes us. It seems fairly open and clear. A lot of the bushes we drive over, or all of them really, will just pop back up. The slower growing hardwoods we don't drive over. And that's important to know because we're not creating nearly as much damage to the environment as you may think we are when we're off-roading and something important to bear in mind is, is that people have been practicing the same behavior in the Sabi sands for over 50 years now and as you can see the bush is still pristine and beautiful so as long as off-roading is managed correctly it has a very very small impact on the environment. question that's just come through from Riley on Twitter and she's interested to know if this young male could potentially jo join the Birmingham coalition which is five young males. There is a small chance of that happening but I would say that they are already too established amongst themselves to accept a newcomer. There's already enough of them and I think if those five boys came across him, he would be in trouble. Again, only time will tell, and certain things in nature, only the animals can answer. It is a great question though, Riley, and that question stemmed from the fact that I said it is possible for males from different prides of That's a tricky question, Ramey. I would say 50-50. I mean, there's just so many variables involved that 
even though there may be statistics and percentages that have been worked out over the years, it will vary greatly from one individual's chances of success to another. But he certainly has survived the most difficult part of his life. And that would have been the first few months Well, Susan and Pam are both interested to know whether I can th see if any of the lioness are pregnant. And to be honest, I can't notice that any of them are pregnant. They could well be. It can be very tricky to tell whether lions and leopards are pregnant, even if you know that they've mated. They give birth to such small young and don't show nearly as much as the herbivores do. That being said, according to the report that they were mating in February, or some of them were, if that mating was successful, there should be some cubs on the way. Now they're moving very slowly, intently, stopping and listening. And like I said earlier, this is common. What they can smell and what they can hear, I don't know. But one lioness does seem to be looking very intently to the south, and that's her there. But it appears that this may be their next shady stopover point. You can see the young male, and this is what's going to get him kicked out. He is attempting to mate with one of the lioness there, and he did try and do it earlier on this morning too. And he can't be blamed for that. That's Like I said, it is getting very hot, so the likelihood of them moving are becoming less and less as it does become hotter, but then again, these animals so often prove us wrong, and yesterday afternoon was no difference. It was still very hot when they arrived at the Juma waterhole, surprisingly. And it certainly was a big surprise when I got a call through on the radio that they had been spotted there. So this is all eight of them lying here in the grass and I wonder what their next meal is going to be. For those of you who don't know, their last successful kill was 
an abnormal kill for them to make. They managed to take down a hippo. It wasn't fully grown, but it kept them fed for over 48 hours. And although certain individuals' bellies still show the effects of two and a half days of eating, others are beginning to show that they're already quite hungry. And this It's quite often that you leave lions fast asleep in the morning. Maui on Los Angeles, good morning, and Maui's interested to know how long can lions survive for without food and or water and comfortably three to four days, that's very comfortably they can go without a meal from being full bellied to their next meal is like I say an easier three to four day affair but they will feed as often as they can on the opposite end of the spectrum lions could survive for probably a week without food and water and the individual lions in question will vary you get some lions that occur in desert areas that will very seldom actually drink water and they'll acquire all their liquid from the prey that they eat And it really is interesting to see how the same species of animals can adapt and evolve to survive well in certain areas that are very different to other areas where you get the same species. I think here it's fair to say the lion are spoilt. There's always water around, even in the driest of months in winter. And there certainly is also food. It's just a matter of hunting and catching the food that can sometimes be a little bit tricky. For those of you who may have just joined this morning's show, firstly a very warm welcome and just to fill you in on exactly what's been happening this morning, we got extremely lucky and found these lion very close to where we left them last night at Gowrie Dam and after an initial bit of guessing that they're gonna put on a show for us this evening their increased hunger will hopefully drive them to try and catch something and we very very seldom get to share and experience them making kills and I think it's fair to say it's something that is a little bit overdue also just to let you know the funny beeping noises you've been hearing on the radio is a new radio system and we're busy trying to to fine-tune the radios and the guys will be back out early next week to try and solve all of these strange beeping noises you can hear.
Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Well, I think these line are not going to do too much more this morning. And there are a few more vehicles that would like to come and have a look here. There is a three vehicle protocol per sighting. And considering that we've been here the whole morning, I think it's only fair that we head off. We will certainly pop in a little bit later and also listen to the radio as the morning progresses, should they get up or should anything exciting happen, we will rush back here. But for now, I think it might be worth heading off yeah. and having a look at what else is happening here. It's a large property and we do need to search around to try and find things. Well, hang on. What's happening? And here, what has this one lioness seen or heard? It's certainly gently in that direction. Certainly, not go anywhere until we've established what has caught these lions attention. There's just one of them. This is now relaxed. 